Hi everyone, I'm Jerry Schumann, pastor here at Ludlow Baptist Church. Thank you for joining us today. We hope that this video blesses and encourages you in your faith. And please consider sharing this on social media. Doing so is a strategic way that we're able to share the gospel with other people today. But before we begin, please keep this in mind. This video is not intended to be, and really it cannot be, a replacement for your commitment to a local church. God commands his people to gather regularly for worship and for fellowship under the leadership and the care of godly elders where the whole body is knit together and that's how the body grows and builds itself up in love. So nothing online can be a replacement for that. So if you're in the area, uh, come and join us for worship. We'd love to have you with us. If you're not nearby, please be sure that you are committed to a local, faithful, Bible-believing church. Thank you, and God bless. Well, Father, we pray that as we come to your word today, that we would remember that man does not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds from the mouth of God. And so we thank you, Father, that you have given your word to us through the holy prophets and through your apostles that it has been preserved by your power to us and uh, that just as it was alive and active when it was written, uh, this word here almost 3,000 years ago, uh, we are thankful that it is just as living and active today, that it pierces the division of soul and spirit, that it discerns the thoughts and intentions of the heart, that it is sufficient for making us wise unto salvation and that it makes the man of God complete, equipped for every good work. So I ask, Father, that you give us eagerness of spirit and receptivity, that you would do your powerful work within us, strengthen our faith, and produce faith where there is none. And show us Christ today, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, back in 1939, the king and queen of England visited Montreal, Quebec, Canada, uh, being a self-governing dominion under the British crown at that time. And they were met at the airport by Montreal's 300-pound mayor, Camilla Hood. My French is not good, but that's my best attempt. Camilla Hood, at, in an open limousine to pick them up. Now, to understand what happens next, you need to understand a little bit about the mayor, Camilla Hood. Uh, during World War II, he spent the majority of time in prison because he objected to men from Quebec serving in the army uh, in, uh, of Canada. He objected to that, and so he was in prison almost the entire time. And then, of course, when he was released from prison toward the end of the war, uh, he was re-elected re as mayor by a wide margin. He was, he was beloved by his people, but he was a brash man. He was a very forward man. Well, as the limousine carrying Hood and the Queen rolled down Sherbrooke in the heart of Montreal, all the people, being under the British crown, cheered and waved their British flags. And Hood leaned over to the Queen and remarked, You know, some of this is for you. Some of this is for you. Well, Hood, as a vice regent under the British crown, he did not know his proper place. To whatever degree there's truth in what he said, he did not know his proper place. And it's incumbent upon a vice regent who's under a higher authority to know his proper place. And if ever there's a time in which a vice regent needs to know his proper place, it's the king in Israel. First Samuel, the entire book, and second Samuel, it's all about the establishment of the monarchy in Israel. And what we've seen so far is that the ultimate king, the king overall, not just over Israel, but over all the nations, is God. He's the one true king. He's the creator of all. He's the Lord of all. And we've seen in 1 Samuel that God, the one true king, has ordained to mediate his rule, not only over his own people, but over the entire world through his anointed one, through the king that he has chosen. We've seen this right away in 1 Samuel chapter 2 in Hannah's song. Hannah's song says this, The Lord will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. The Lord will judge the earth. His purposes for salvation and judgment will be accomplished through his anointed, through his king. Mark Boda says this, 
the royal figure in Israel was not to consider himself as the exclusive occupant on the throne. Rather, the king reigned as a vice regent, exercising God's rule in Israel and ultimately throughout the entire earth. And so this is what makes the kingship in 1 Samuel such a big deal, is because God is mediating his rule through his king. But what we saw in 1 Samuel thus far is that the first king, Saul, he did not know his place. He did not know his place. He was not obedient to the one true king. He did not live in submission to the one true king. He consistently rebelled against him, disobeyed his word, and because of that, God rejected him as being king. And God said, in the place of Saul, I'm going to choose a man uh, after my own sovereign choice. He won't be the king's choice for king. He's going to be my choice for king. And he's going to be a man after my own heart. One who humbly, submissively, obediently is living life under my authority. And what we see in 1 Samuel, though, is David is anointed as king in 1 Samuel 16. But then we see he's not exalted as king for the entire rest of 1 Samuel. And there's 31 chapters in 1 Samuel. And the majority of that time is David is running from King Saul who's trying to kill him and put him to death. And so what, what's the point? What's the main point that God is telling us in these 15 chapters or so of David's anointed, he is God's choice, and yet he's not established as king yet. He's running from King Saul. The main point is this. God is telling us that David is indeed the legitimate heir to the throne. 1 Samuel 16 all the way through 31 is proof that when David becomes king, that he indeed is qualified to reign as king. We see in these passages that David is mighty in battle, and that comes from being anointed by the Spirit. And having the Spirit is necessary if he's going to be a faithful vice regent. We see that as he's hounded by Saul, as he's running for his life, that he walks by faith. He keeps looking to the Lord, trusting in him, seeking the face of God. And this shows us a man who is humble and dependent upon God. We also see that when David has opportunities to strike down King Saul, and he has another opportunity in this passage, each time he refuses. And this shows us his faithfulness as well, because David understands that the vice regent, the authority of being God's vice regent over his people and over the world, that's not an authority that you can grasp. That's an authority that can only be bestowed by God. And so by David's patience here in this passage and in the other passages where he doesn't lay his hand and strike King Saul, it's showing that he's waiting upon God to exalt him as king in his due time. So what I want you to see in this passage is this. Four demonstrations of the faith of David, the faith of the Lord's anointed, submitting himself to God, so that you might see the greater faithfulness of the one that David points to, who is Jesus Christ, so that you might trust Jesus more fully. So I want you to see four demonstrations of David's faith. And the first is the patience of David's faith. So chapter 26 is, as Yogi Bear would put it, it's deja vu all over again. That's what we see in this passage. It's deja vu all over again. It was back in chapter 24 that David had an opportunity to kill King Saul. That happened in the cave when Saul came in. He didn't know that David and his men were deeper into the cave. And David had the opportunity to kill King Saul, and yet he refused to strike the Lord's anointed. And instead, he cut away a portion of Saul's royal robe, and he kept it for himself. And then he showed that as proof to Saul that he could have struck him but he refused to do so. And so here in our passage, we see another opportunity that David has to strike King Saul. Verses 1 through 5 are all just laying the groundwork, the setting for this passage. So again, we see it's the Ziphites. The Ziphites again betray David, just as they did back in chapter 23. They tell King Saul, Saul, David, the man you're hunting, he's amongst us again. Do you want to come and get him? And so Saul comes down with 3,000 chosen men. Again, that's the same number as back in chapter 23. Five times the amount of men that David has as his soldiers. And he pursues David into the wilderness, in the wilderness of Ziph. And I wonder, Dusty and Rick, do we have that, uh, that map here that shows the geography a little bit? Just to give you an idea of where this is taking place. So 
This does not show the entirety of Israel. The lowest point of Israel is in the tribe of Judah, which is around here. That's the tribe of Judah. Uh, Israel, of course, goes all the way up to the uh, Sea of Galilee up here and then around this portion. So where David is, let's see, the headquarters is up here in Gibeah. That's where Saul's headquarters, his palace is located. And David is down here in the wilderness of Ziph, just south of Ziph right here. So that's where, that's where David is. Saul comes with his men to pursue David right here. Thanks, Rick. Thanks, Dusty. So he comes down with his men. David sent out spies to see if indeed uh, he was there. He learned that he had indeed had come. And then David went with a few men on his own special mission. He saw Saul's encampment. He saw all the men around Saul. And he saw Saul in the center of his encampment. And then David, in verse 6, being the courageous, daring man that he is, he asked two men who were with him, Ahimelech and Abishai, if one of them would like to go down with him to meet Saul and his men. Two men against 3,000. And Abishai agrees. Uh, we're going to learn more about Abishai as time goes around, uh, along here. But just suffice to say for right now, Abishai is one of uh, three sons of David's sister, Zariah. So Abishai is David's nephew. And he and his two brothers, Joab and Ahazel, uh, they are all very, they become very powerful soldiers, very mighty soldiers. Joab becomes the commander in David's army. And Ahazel, as well as Abishai, they become part of David's mighty men. David has he ends up having 37 mighty men. These are men of renown, men of great valor. And so you can see the valor, the courage of Abishai. He says, David, I'll go with. Let, let's, let's go get them. What kind of mission are we going on? Sign me up. So he goes with David into the encampment. It's at night. And they, as they come to the encampment, they slowly work past the sleeping soldiers. And no one awakens. And they keep going further in, further in, further in, until they get all the way to Saul at the center of the encampment and no one wakes up and no one stirs. And we read how this happens in verse 12 where it says, No man saw it or knew it, nor did any awake, for they were all asleep because a deep sleep from the Lord had fallen upon them. Just as God put Adam into that deep sleep at the very beginning and then removed one of his ribs, and made the first woman with that rib, made Eve from that rib. So God put the entire army of Saul under this deep sleep. And so they didn't hear them sneaking about. They didn't hear them talking to one another as well. Uh, they didn't hear when they took the spear and the jar of water and escaped. They are in a deep, deep slumber. Well, Abishai, he sees uh, when they come to Saul, they see Saul's spear stuck in the ground right by his head. And Abishai, he sees all this, and he says this in verse 8. God has given your enemy into your hand this day. He emphasizes, David, this is your enemy. This is the man who's been pursuing you for years, seeking to kill you even though you've done nothing wrong. In fact, when you've been kind to Saul, when you've had mercy upon him, even sparing his life, he's still pursuing you. If anyone's worthy of being put to death, it's this man. It's your enemy. And he says, God has given him into your hand. David, look at what's happening here. Look where we are. <laughs> here we are in the center of Saul's encampment. No one has woken up. And here is Saul's spear right at his head, inviting us. Strike me. Kill me. Put me to death. This is God's hand, David. And I know you've had qualms before about putting your hand against the Lord's anointed. I'll do it. Let me strike him once. I don't need to strike him twice, and he'll be dead. Now, if David looked at all the circumstances here, uh, Abishai's argument could be pretty compelling, couldn't it be? It, it seemed to make sense. This is God's will. And yet, this is such an important point. David does not interpret the circumstances of life apart from the commands of God. And that's something we need to internalize. Don't interpret the circumstances of life, you know, a, a feeling in your spirit or an open door or opportunities or things like that. Don't interpret those things apart from the commands of God. God's commands guide us, not the circumstances. And this is not 
an opportunity for David to strike down King Saul because God has said in his, in his word of the important place of the Lord's anointed. So David says this in verse 9. He says, Do not destroy him, for who can put out his hand against the Lord's anointed and be guiltless? David argues here not that Saul is a good man or that he's not worthy of death. He is worthy of death. But he argues here not to harm him because of his office. Because he's the Lord's anointed. Even though Saul has been rejected by God as king, he was still anointed by Samuel to be king over the people of God. And being anointed as king, he's being set apart by God to be God's vice regent to rule over the people of God. And so David knows that to strike down God's anointed is also an attack on God himself. And so David does not argue here based upon the danger. If we strike him, they might hear us. He argues here upon the guilt that would come upon them. If we do this, we will not be guiltless. And so David refuses to put his hand again against Saul. Even though Saul is pursuing him once again, Saul is doing him wrong once again, he refuses to return evil for, or, uh, re return evil for evil because he's holding fast to God's word. So what I want you to see here is the patience of David's faith. Years and years of enduring this evil, this opposition, and yet he still refuses to respond with evil. Well, how is he able to do this? Look at what he says in verse 10. As the Lord lives, the Lord will strike him, or his day will come to die, or he will go down into battle and perish. The Lord forbid that I should put up my hand against the Lord's anointed. Even though David has been running from King Saul for a very long time, he has every confidence that God as the judge of all will bring vengeance upon this wicked man. He doesn't know how it's going to happen. He says, the Lord may strike him down just as he struck down Nabal. Or his time may come, meaning he's going to die a natural death. Or he might die in battle, which is exactly what happens. So David doesn't know how it's going to happen. But David has every confidence that God as the judge of all will bring vengeance on this wicked man. And he's not going to usurp the place of the judge of all and execute vengeance upon King Saul. David has internalized the truth that he just learned back in chapter 25, or the truth that he was reminded of with Nabal and with Abigail. God is the judge of all. Vengeance belongs to him, and he will repay. That's what Abigail had reminded David of. God will strike down those who oppose the righteous. So David can be patient in suffering because he knows that God is the judge and God will repay. And therefore, he can entrust Saul's wrongdoing, even repeated wrongdoing, to God. And this is what faith does. When we're opposed, when we're maligned, when we have opposition that comes to us, and we will have that as disciples of Jesus Christ, we can have patience and not return evil for evil, but return good for evil because we know there's a judge of all. Vengeance belongs to him, and he will certainly repay. The patience of faith. The second thing we see is the encouragement of faith in the tokens of God's grace. So David and Abishai, they take the spear, they take Saul's water jug, and they scurry on out of Saul's encampment. No one wakes up. They get a ways away to a hill and a great distance in between, and then Saul lifts up his voice in the middle of the night and awakens the whole army. It, it, it's just another act of God, isn't it? They don't wake up when, he's, when they're scurrying through here, even talking amongst themselves and taking these items. But when he's a great distance off and raising his voice, then they all wake up. So he calls out to Abner, who's the commander of Saul's army. And he says, will you not answer, Abner? And you can imagine Abner waking up from his sleep and saying, who are you who calls to the king? And David's response here is to give a scathing rebuke to Abner and also to the other soldiers of their failure to protect King Saul. He says in verse 15, Are you not a man? And who is like you in Israel? And of course, as the commander of the army, he is the supreme man. He is, he is the esteemed one in all of Israel. Why then have you not kept watch over your lord the king? 
for one of the people came in to destroy the king, your lord. Now, all the responsibilities that Abner and the soldiers had, and they had many different responsibilities uh, for provisions, for uh, authority, you know, authority over other soldiers, of course, courage in battle, being victorious, things like that. Of all the responsibilities they had, the number one responsibility is what? Protecting the king. And David is saying, you have failed in your number one responsibility. And he's saying this because it highlights their guilt. They're at fault. They're the ones worthy to die. And here they're pursuing someone who is not worthy to die. He's highlighting their own guiltiness and his own righteousness by comparison. But then David gives this proof to his accusations that they deserve to die. He gives his proof in verse 16. He says this, And now see where the king's spear is and the jar of water that was at his head. And you can imagine Abner looking around. He was stationed by King Saul, looks over there, and the spear and the water are gone, which means that this man, call out in the middle of the night, that he's telling the truth. They failed to protect the king, and this is a sign that they are worthy, uh, they, they deserve to die. They've not protected the Lord's anointed. Now, what I want you to see here is this is not only a sign to Saul uh, and to all the men that someone could have struck down the Lord's anointed, but if David had eyes to see, and I think he did have eyes to see, this is also a sign of God's favor upon David. And we understand this by what the spear represents. He took Saul's spear. But what does his spear represent? It's not just a weapon that Saul had. It's a symbol of his royal authority. We've seen a lot of Saul's spear throughout 1 Samuel, haven't we? And he's often seated on his throne with his spear in hand. So, for example, in 1 Samuel 18 and 19, as David is playing the harp to King Saul, as the evil spirit is coming upon him, he's seated with his spear in hand. In 1 Samuel 20, verse 33, when Jonathan comes to his father to appeal on behalf of King David, why are you doing him harm? There, uh, Saul has his spear in hand. And why don't you turn back to chapter 22, verse 6. Uh, here's Saul having his royal pity party. And uh, he's, he's, he's uh, paranoid that all of his men are betraying him. Look at what it says. Now Saul heard that David was discovered... And the men who were with him, Saul was sitting at Gibeah under the tamarisk tree on the height with his spear in his hand. He, he always has a spear in hand. And so what a scepter is, when we think of a king, a scepter, king has a scepter, which symbolizes his royal authority. That's what Saul's spear is to him. It's a symbol of his royal authority. But now Saul's spear is gone. And who has it? David, the Lord's anointed. The one whom he's pursuing and trying to kill. And what this shows both David and Saul is that Saul's power as a king is gone. And nothing is going to prevent David from obtaining the kingdom. Nothing will prevent David from obtaining the kingdom. This is a sign from God to encourage David, you shall be king. And so also, we need to take to heart the... Uh, and, and, and to be encouraged by the tokens of God's grace that he gives to us. For example, our Lord has given us the charge in the Great Commission to go and make disciples of all nations. That's the commission he's given to us. That's a word to be pursuing and to be laboring towards. Now, do we see right now, do we see all nations, all tongues, all tribes, do we see all of them professing faith in Christ? We don't yet. There are many that have still not heard the gospel of Jesus Christ, and they still not come to saving knowledge of faith in Christ. And yet, if we just step back and look at what Christ has done over the last 2,000 years, do we see many encouraging tokens of God's grace? We see hundreds upon hundreds of millions of people that have come to saving faith in Christ. And every continent, in essentially every nation right now, there's at least some that have come to saving faith in Christ. And so as we're thinking about this charge that our Lord has given us, we shouldn't grow weary. We shouldn't say this is futile. We should say, look at what Christ has done. Look at how the gospel has penetrated Africa over the last hundred years. Or look how it's penetrated China over the last hundred years. And the church is largest in China of all the nations of the earth. Look at what Christ is doing. He is building his church. And therefore, 
Let's keep persevering. Let's keep pressing on. Our Lord is with us. We ought to take to heart the tokens of God's grace that he gives us and let that fuel us in our faith. A third demonstration of David's faithfulness is the longing of faith for the presence of God. Verses 17 through 20. So Saul recognizes David's voice. He calls out to David. And David begins by testing his own innocence. He says in verse 18, Why does my Lord pursue after his servant? For what have I done? What evil is on my hands? These questions emphasize that David has done no wrong. And Saul is in the wrong to be once again pursuing him. And then in verses 19 through 20, we get a, a picture into the heart of David. David says this, Now therefore, let my king, Lord the king, hear the words of his servant. If it is the Lord who has stirred you up against me, may he accept an offering. But if it is men, may they be cursed before the Lord. For they have driven me out this day that I should have no share in the heritage of the Lord, saying, go serve other gods. What we have here is a picture into what grieves David most with being a fugitive for so many years. What do you think it might be? The comforts that he has not been able to enjoy over the last several years? The privileges of once serving in the king's palace as the king's servant? The family, the friends that he's been separated from? The constant danger that he's had of death over these years? What do you think it might, might grieve him the most? Well, here he says, you have driven me away that I might have no share in the heritage of the Lord. Well, what does he mean by that? What's the heritage of the Lord? Well, this is speaking of, uh, actually turn back in, uh, in chapter 10. Turn back to 1 Samuel chapter 10. We see it used over here as well when uh, Saul is anointed as king. Look at what Samuel says to Saul at the very end of verse 1. He says, And this shall be the sign to you, that the Lord has anointed you to be prince over his heritage. To be prince over his heritage. The heritage of the Lord is the people of God dwelling in the place of God. The people of God are God's people. They belong to God. And the land, the land of Canaan, is God's dwelling place. And so David says, you have driven me away from the heritage of the Lord, from the people of God, and from the dwelling place of God. It's in Israel where God dwells amongst his people. He dwells amongst them uniquely in the tabernacle. It's there where God's people offered sacrifices to God, celebrated feasts to God, and presented worship to God. And what grieves David the most is that by Saul pursuing him, he's been kept away from the people of God, the worship of God, and the presence of God in the tabernacle. Look at what it says in verse 20. Now, therefore, let not my blood fall to the earth away from the presence of the Lord. For the king of Israel has come out to seek a single flea like one who hunts a partridge in the mountains. We might say to this, David, don't you understand? God's presence is everywhere. You don't have to be in the land of Israel in order to enjoy the presence of God. You can pray to God wherever you are. You're in the wilderness. You can pray to him there. Why are you speaking of being driven from the Lord's presence? Well, David understands that in the old covenant, that God's glory dwelt uniquely with his people in the tabernacle, later replaced by the temple. And to be away from that is to be away from the glory of the Lord, the presence of the Lord. David says this in Psalm 63, verse 2. He says, So I've looked upon you in the sanctuary, beholding your power and glory. To be away then from the sanctuary is to be away from God's power and his glory, his presence. Dale Davis says this, To be cut off from the ordinances of public worship is David's most severe grief. To be cut off from the public ordinances of worship is David's most severe grief. Do you have that kind of longing for worship with the people of God? That as we gather as the living temple of God, a temple not made with stones, but God's word says we're, we're living stones. We're indwelt by the Holy Spirit of God, built together as a dwelling place for God. And as we gather each Lord's Day, 
and then throughout the week as well, and offer up worship to the living, living God. And as we receive the means of grace week by week to strengthen us and encourage us in our faith, is that something that you love and that you look forward to? And when you're prevented from being able to gather with the people of God, maybe by sickness or by bad weather or something else, does that grieve you? Are you torn up in your spirit and say, I so wish I could be there, but I can't be there. God, give me grace that I might be able to return to enjoy your presence with the people of God. It's very common today for professing Christians to say, I love God, but I'm not interested in the church to gather with the people of God to worship God. My friend, that person is self-deluded. If that person has no love for the presence of God with the people of God, they don't know God. They don't know God. You cannot have the Spirit of God dwelling in you and have no desire for the presence of God with the people of God to worship God. Every true believer will say with David in Psalm 27, verse 4, One thing I have asked of the Lord, that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, to gaze upon the beauty of the Lord and to dwell in the sanctuary. If that's true in the Old Testament with a temple of stone, how much more ought it to be true with us who are the living temple of God? That our desire is we want to enjoy the presence of God with the family of God as we worship God. That's my delight. That's what I cherish. That's what I love. And so we see David's faith in saying that his great desire is it's the presence of God. And then finally, see the confidence of faith in God alone that he has. So Saul's response to David's righteousness and mercy shown to him is to confess his sin and to plead with David to return to him. We see that in verse 21. Return, my son David. For I will no more harm you, because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Well, David has heard this before. Saul, he'll confess his sin, because he hates the consequences of sin. But one thing that's common with Saul is he never has a godly sorrow. His sin is never against God. He never grieves that he has offended God, wronged God, and wants forgiveness from God. It's always, I hate the consequences of sin, so please forgive me. And God's word says, Having a godly sorrow, that leads to repentance. But having a worldly sorrow, which is what Saul has, that just leads to death. And that's what Saul has. And so David doesn't put his confidence in Saul. Look where he puts his confidence. Verses 23 and 24. He says, The Lord rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. For the Lord gave you into my hand today, and I would not put up my hand against the Lord's anointed. Behold, as your life was precious this day in my sight, so may my life be precious in the sight of the Lord, and may he deliver me out of all tribulation. David is saying, my confidence, Saul, is not with you. I'm not going to go with you. He ends up calling for one of Saul's servants, come and get your king's spear. You can have it back, and you can take it back to him. But I'm not going with him. My confidence is in the Lord, the one who it says here, rewards every man for his righteousness and his faithfulness. God's word tells us, we reap what we sow. If we sow according to the flesh, that will bring corruption. We will, we will reap. But if we sow according to the Spirit, if we are walking by the Spirit, then God will bless us. As we're walking in righteousness, God will see that and He will reward us. And David knows that. And so as he's in the wilderness, away from all of his comforts, he's saying, my comfort, my refuge is in the Lord. That's where I'm putting my trust. And then we see Saul's words in verse 25 that confirm that David is the rightful heir to the throne. He says, Blessed be you, my son David. You will do many things and will succeed in them. And so in all this, what we see is that David is the legitimate heir to be the king on the throne. As God's vice regent, he truly knows his place. He's in submission to God. He lives his life in obedience to the true king. And therefore, he has the right to reign as king. And my friends, all this points forward, like we've seen throughout 1 Samuel, to who? It's the son of David. It's the David's greater son. It's the Jesus Christ. Jesus Christ truly has the right to reign as king. Jesus is the, is the perfect vice regent. He always obeyed God. 
He always did what was pleasing to God. He always walked in obedience of faith. He always longed for the presence of God. His confidence was always in God. And not only that, but when he had opportunities to seize power, to seize the throne, he always refused. He had opportunities as well. Uh, one we've talked about a few times over these last several months is when the devil came to him in the wilderness, isn't that interesting, in the wilderness as well, and said, Jesus, I'll give you all the nations of the earth. They can be yours. All you have to do is just bow down and worship me. You can have this power. You can have authority over all the nations. And Jesus refused. Another time was in John chapter 6, after Jesus had fed the 5,000. And the people there, they're amazed at the power of Jesus. And it says they try to make him king by force. But Jesus will not grasp onto that power. He's not going to seize onto to be that kind of a king, a king of, of earthly and political power who conquers Rome through armies. Uh, that's not God's will for him. And so he rejects that. Jesus knows that the kingdom of God, it's not going to be established by him seizing power. It's going to be established by God exalting Jesus in his due time. And so Jesus was obedient. Jesus was submissive. And that obedience led him all the way to where? To the cross. All the way to the cross. There Jesus suffered and bled and died on the cross. Not for his own sins, but for our sins. So that anyone who repents of their sin, confesses it to God, forsakes their sin, and puts their trust in Jesus Christ, that that work that Jesus Christ has accomplished is applied to their lives they're forgiven of all their sins, and they're given eternal life. Jesus' obedience went all the way to the cross. And God the Father looked in favor upon Christ's sacrifice, upon his obedience, and his response was to raise our Lord and to exalt him. He raised him from the dead. That was the first part of his exaltation. And Jesus showed himself that he was alive to many, many of his disciples over many days with many proofs. He is risen. And then, before his own disciples' eyes, Jesus ascended up into heaven on the clouds. And the angel said, just as he's gone up into heaven, he's going to come back down the same way. So Jesus has been exalted into heaven. And when he was brought into heaven, what happened then? God, God the Father said to Jesus Christ, his obedient anointed one, he said, sit at my right hand until I make your enemies a footstool for your feet in fulfillment of Psalm 110. And so God has exalted Jesus, his obedient vice-regent, as King of kings and as Lord of lords. Peter says this in Acts 2, 33 and 36. It says of Jesus, being therefore exalted at the right hand of God, let all the house of Israel therefore know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. And so what does this mean? This means Jesus is the rightful ruler. He is the rightful ruler. Know for certain that God, not man, God has made Jesus both Lord and Christ. He has given him all authority in heaven and on earth and under the earth that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and every knee should bow to the glory of God the Father. God has declared this through his exaltation of Jesus at the right time because he is the faithful vice regent. And so our proper response to this ought to be humility, trust, and worship. Humility, trust, and worship. You know, what a perfect song for the message today. Is he worthy? Jesus makes astonishing claims on us. He says, you must repent. You must deny yourself. You must pick up your cross and you must follow after me. And he gives glorious promises. Come on to me, all you who are weary and heavy laden, and I will give you rest. Jesus demands everything from us. And the question is, is he worthy? Or is he a fraud? Is he worthy of us committing our lives and our souls to him? Or is he a fraud? Is he an imposter? The fact that God exalted Jesus is God's declaration to us. He's worthy. He's worthy. And friend, if you're here today, and if you're not yet a believer in Jesus Christ, God being, God having exalted Jesus from the dead on high to his right hand is God declaring to you, Jesus is worthy. 
He's worthy for you to trust him. He's worthy for you to commit your life to him. He's worthy for you to cry out to him and, and, and cry out for forgiveness. He is worthy. So friend, if you're here today and you're not yet a believer in Jesus Christ, I call on you on behalf of Lord Jesus Christ. Turn from your sins. Look to faith in Jesus Christ. Call on his name. And was it Brent? Did you share this, brother? Call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and you will be saved. Or maybe that's Tom. You will be saved. No ifs, ands, or buts about it. So brothers and sisters, Jesus is worthy. Let's pray. So Father, I pray that the response to this would be that our trust and our dependence upon Christ would increase and would deepen. That our faith in him would be solidified. That we would trust his promises more faithfully. That we would trust his faithfulness. We would trust his love, his goodness, his kindness to us. And Father, I pray that all of us would be able to say from the bottom of our heart, my hope is in the Lord who gave himself for me. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.